Hello, everyone. Shall we talk a little bit about wine now? Did you know there are about a million wines in the world, about 100,000 made every single year? Most people, when they imagine a winemaker's life, they imagine morning walks through a vineyard. They imagine swirls of wine in a glass. But the truth is, a winemaker's life is actually very difficult. Most of what a winemaker has to deal with is governed by something well beyond their control, the weather. And it turns out that it's not just the winemaker, it's through the entire supply chain. Let's meet some people who are in the wine industry facing these challenges. So this is Peter and Amy. Peter and Amy live and work on the West Coast. They have a winery based in a place called Lompoc. Uh, I don't know how many of you know where Lompoc is without a map. Their challenge in the wine industry is to let consumers know how beautiful wine, uh, what beautiful wine can come from this part of the world. Here's Alex, Alex and his wife and his children. Alex is originally from London. Alex woke up one day and brought his family uh, to France, to the Pyrenees, a place called Languedoc. They bought an auberge and they operate it on a day-to-day -day basis. Their challenge was to create a personalized experience within the Languedoc, while at the same time being able to spend time with their guests. So here's Brandon and Ian. Uh, many of you may know Ian Cobble from the movie Psalm. He told his story of how difficult it was to become a master sommelier, something very, very difficult indeed. Their challenge, these college buddies that started this really neat new retail concept, their challenge was to figure out a way to cater very specifically to their clients to use smart software, but to do so in a way that left room for their own personal touch. So wine. It's crazy. Wine has been around for 8,000 years. Uh, there's proof positive to this. That's a wine jug uh, called Cavevri uh, that scientists found outside of a place called Tbilisi in Georgia. Uh, this particular uh, tradition uh, has had a long heritage in Europe, thousands and thousands of years, but only made it to the United States a couple of hundred years ago. In fact, the United States economy having to do with the wine industry almost got stopped before it got started. A constitutional amendment, something we remember as prohibition, nearly stopped the wine industry in its tracks. In fact, People couldn't make wine, legally. They couldn't make wine for anything other than sacramental purposes or for religious purposes. I don't know about you, but I would have found religion. The American market, though, bounced back, roared back, and is now the largest, most robust in the world. So how many times do you walk into a store and choose a product based upon a number? Is this crazy? Is this nuts, the way the wine industry works? This shorthand, this critic's review, this number is supposed to tell you what you're supposed to like. And it's funny because wine has been around about 8,000 years, writing about 6,000 years, and the wine critic has been around for almost as long as writing has been around, telling people what to drink. It's important though, it's a shorthand. It gives you a sense, especially if you find a critic that you like, but it's not your personal taste. So how did I find myself in the wine industry? This is my dad. My dad is a New Yorker. I'm originally from New York. My dad was the first in our family to go to college, graduated, got one of his first jobs and wanted a promotion came home and he said to my mom, we're gonna have a party. We're going to invite my boss so I can get my promotion and we're going to serve wine because we wanna make a good impression. They opened the wine that night, I tasted it. To this very day, I do not remember what that wine was, but it made a tremendous impression on me. 
I never forgot it. But it's no wonder that I don't remember, because most people don't grow up with a sense of tradition having to do with wine. This is what you see when you walk into a wine store. Uh, if you're not looking at the numbers, you're looking at a whole group of labels with words that you don't understand because they're literally in a foreign language. Producers, grapes, places. There's no wonder that you can't figure out what you're going to like when you're looking at a wall of labels that look like this. So if the critic was the first recommendation system for wine, something that you might like, the labels, especially the big brand labels, might be considered the second recommendation system for wine. And these wine labels, very much like other big brands, were indicative of a lifestyle. They were indicative of a certain quality. They were indeed a shorthand. And they helped consumers find their way through the wine industry. They were very useful. They gave rise, in some circumstances, however, to something we think of as the sameness of wine. So wine that tastes very much like the one next to it and the one next to that. And it doesn't allow us the opportunity for the beauty and the diversity of all of the wines in the world. And so as we were looking at this problem, our main goal, figuring out how to preserve this beautiful cultural heritage around the world. So our vision was to connect the world's consumers with the world's producers, whether that producer was just down the road or if that producer was a half a world away, to build a technology platform that could do that, that could effectively connect supply with demand based upon individual consumer preference. So today, we are the leading AI-driven wine preference engine in the world. We have seven patents, another couple of dozen that are pending. So we have commanded this space. Something happened along the way, though, that we weren't expecting. We became more human in the context of building an artificial intelligence platform. So the third recommendation system for wine Wine Ring allows you to trust your own opinion. You don't have to trust a robot. You trust your own opinion. And when we were trying to solve this problem, we had to sort a system that would capture the nature of individual preference in the first instance so it could be used in a commercial sense. So we looked at collaborative filtering. Those of you who may be uh, in the science know that this is effectively groupthink. Uh, somebody who bought this is supposed to be predictive of what you're going to like, which intuitively makes no sense at all to me for a consumer product, but certainly not for mine. We also looked at content-based filtering, and there are a lot of very effective systems out there that use content-based recommendations as their approach. This is a characterization of the individual product. The thing about that, and sensory consumer products, our field, is that people don't sense wine as individual characteristics. Even if you're not a wine pro, you get a sense. You are working with smell and taste, which are the oldest of our sensory perceptions. And your mind, your brain, your, your human self understands that and feels that. So how could we build something that would be able to tap into that? So if you want to think like a human, a human expert, why not go to the source? There are two organizations in the world, the Institute of the Masters of Wine and the Court of Master Sommeliers. Taken together, there are 500 people, only 500 people in the world that taste at this level. The ability to take a glass of wine, to be able to smell it, to taste it, and to identify the presence and the absence of hundreds and hundreds of different characteristics, and to do so blind, to do so not even knowing what the wine is. That's the training. We have one of the largest teams in the world doing just that. 
So one of our masters, Molly Battenhouse, who also works with Jackson Family Wines, uh, we asked her recently to taste a wine. This is a white wine from Spain uh, to give you a sense. Now, this is a real wine pro. This is not someone too cool for school, uh, a poser. This is the real thing. So today we have a white wine. Um, this wine is clear. It's day bright or star bright. It's very, very reflective. Uh, the color at the core is uh, sort of a medium straw with hints of green. Um, there's a tiny bit of gas here, just indicating a little submerged CO2 in the wine on the nose. The wine is clean and sound with moderate plus intensity and really youthful, fresh aromas. So how crazy is this, that someone has the ability to detect all of those things and can translate it to a scientific platform that can do that on your behalf? So how did we do it? Well, it turns out you've known all along whether or not you like something, right? If you love like, basically you find something appealing, or so-so or dislike something, what our software does is it builds a profile just based upon your preferences, just individual preferences. And the way it does that is it rationalizes all of the data that are in our bespoke database in order to be able to deliver the functionalities. Now, yes, we can make recommendations for wine. And yes, they are the best recommendations uh, software can deliver. But what else can you do once you actually understand individual preference? Well, it turns out you can make a whole wine world for an individual person. So you can walk into a retail store and remember those crazy labels that you couldn't read a thing? You can snap a photo of a wine label and our software can run the, the algorithm in reverse and tell you if you're gonna like the wine. You can walk into a restaurant and press a button and the individual preferences of all of your guests will be rationalized together to make a recommendation that you'll all love, and do so pairing with food. You can go to a website now, and it exists, a website where you sign on and it knows who you are, and it makes recommendations for your preferences. You can now do travel based upon your individual preferences. The emails that hit your inbox from wine stores are now based upon what you're going to like. So for those of you who are in the field, you know that this is actually really tough to do. Solving problems that run this deep, this complex, is really, really tough. We approached it in the way that most people approach machine intelligence, which is a two-stack system. The top part of the stack, a series of algorithms that capture the neurophysiology of sense, uh, your sense of smell and your sense of taste. And they also capture the linguistics of those masters and what they're tasting and what they're smelling. And together reaches down into the databases all of that beautiful, perfect data of all of the wines in the world so that you can get, get a recommendation that suits your preferences. And to do so wherever you are in the world, however big the inventory is, big or small. So let's get real. This is a photo taken uh, in London. This is the largest uh, of, this is the International Wine Challenge based in London. Uh, a number of our masters go there every year, our experts and taste thousands and thousands and thousands of wines. And the thing about it is, is once you get them down, uh, the, the machine learning can learn from those data. So you don't need to taste all of those wines every single year. Uh, as happy a thing you might think that might be, it's, uh, very labor intensive. Uh, and so what we do is our experts travel around the world to these tastings, to wineries, in order to be able to capture all of the nuances, all of the beauty of the wines, so that we can preserve this cultural institution. Now, once you can capture the nature of wine, which many people consider to be the most complex of all of consumer products, what else can you do with it? Well, it turns out that the software works for any sensory consumer product. So we've already built and tested for spirits and sake 
effectively anything you can eat, anything that you can drink, anything that your senses capture, we can connect you to those products in the world that you'll love the most. So this is our story. This story got started when we just could not imagine a world without wine. We could just not imagine that all the wines would start to taste the same, that the beautiful individual cultural heritage after 8,000 years would be lost, and it would be lost because machines could predict that sameness, and producers would produce that sameness. And now what we have is we have Peter and Amy with their beautiful winery in the middle of the California coastline. Now people know where Lompoc is, and they can taste their wines. And for those of you who are going to be at the tasting later, Amy and Peter are going to be here pouring their wines. Amy is also a master of wine. When you, look, you, when you go to the Pyrenees and you stay with Alex and his family, he can come over and talk to you about the nature of the wines from the Languedoc that you'll love the most because he understands that you drink wine around the world. And now he can talk to you about the wines that, you, that you're going to love that are right down the road from where he is and where you came to see. When you uh, meet uh, Ian and Brandon, and Brandon is actually uh, here as well tonight, um, you can get a sense that even as a master sommelier, someone who worked incredibly hard to earn the credential, the biggest value of all is the heart, the heart and the soul of people that will not let this industry die. So thank you so much for enjoying uh, this conversation with me. It's a field I love. Uh, and please join me for the tasting later together with the whole team. Thank you very much.